shows what the Fed funds rate is. Like well, okay, sure. I'll, I'll take anything. What's the number? Don't don't cheat. Me. I think it's okay. zero, isn't it? No. It's really low. Yeah, it's very low. It's uh, 0 0.25. Okay. Uh, however, this fluctuates on a daily basis. Okay. The reason the fund, Fed fund rate exists and is a major tool of the federal uh, board is that this is the rate at which the federal government charges to be an intermediary for uncollateralized loans. What does that mean? <laughs> All right. Most loans require collateral. Okay. Most typical is mortgages. Okay. You provide your house as collateral or a security against a certain uh, loan amount. Okay. And most banks, uh, we can go. I can do a whole thing on housing if we want. Because trust me, it's complicated. Uh, but I've done through it twice. Um, so, uncollateralized loans, though, means the risk associated with money transfer just between two individuals. Uh, the federal government moderates this rate to uh, either incentivize or disincentivize banks from continually transferring funds back and forth between e each other. For example, a bank with a surplus can lend to other banks that are in deficit. As this rate rises, banks are encouraged to save more and trade less. Okay, So interest rates in this instance, the federal funds can basically manipulate how much movement there is in the economy of funds. Okay, And that's an important rate because the lower this rate is, the more banks are going to be willing to lend out at a lower discounted rate. So before everything went crazy, the federal funds rate would typically be around 2 to 3% was pretty average. Okay. So, 2 to 3%, that doesn't sound too bad. Interest rates back then were about 6%. Why is that the case? Why is the federal funds rate not the normal rate you receive on the interest of a loan? The answer is pretty simple. Is that banks trading money or the federal government being able to back themselves on uncollateralized loans is virtually zero. Lending to you, on the other hand, has a huge risk associated with it, right? Even car loans. So. That's because you can have things like lose your job, not be able to work, not be able to pay it back, right? Loans are completely predicated on the fact that you will pay at a very specific interval, right? And all of the math and all the calculus and risk assessment is predicated off of that. So we get and arrive at the prime rate. Okay. The prime rate is the rate of expectation on risk. This is a pretty static number. It's 3%. So the prime rate is a combination of the Fed fund rate and the inherent risk on a loan, which is why the prime rate right now is 3.25%. Okay, so if you ever look that up, that's where you're getting. It's 300, so people talk about basis points. So basis points are, uh, I need to remember this. So basis points is equal to 3%, i.e., one basis point is 0 .01, uh, 0 .1, 0 .01 of, a, of a percentage. They do this because otherwise the ton of zeros get added to a lot of financial calculations. It's a lot easier to talk about basis points rather than percents because percents are an already a math calculation of itself. Okay, so we have the prime rate. Okay, then we have the standard lending rate. Okay. Standard lending rates vary by what you are being lent. Okay? The typical ones are your homes and your automobiles. Uh, okay. Spell that wrong. That's a 
first one, and then you have to individuals, right? And then you have the whole class of business loans. You have large business loans, you have small business loans. The inherent risk for you depends on the collateral of your loan, generally, and your income level. So, what basically happened uh, in the bubble was the standard lending rates for homes and automobiles, they got greatly underestimated the risk associated with the loans. So, what happened is people that could afford at the time with a very low interest rate uh, were being given loans, okay? And they were giving, being given loans at around 6%. Uh, sorry, around. Yeah. They were originally 6%, was a pretty standard home loan. And that dropped to about 4%. Okay. This jump between 6 and 4%, i.e., 200 basis points, is astronomical when we talk about compounding interest over the life of a $200,000 loan. Okay. So people that were, make 50, were making $50,000 a year could actually afford fairly substantial loans to be able to buy a home in this instance, as opposed to being able to rent or do something like uh, or being able to rent. And the banks were like, money for everyone, right? And usually what happens is that the federal government says, no, you have to meet certain qualifications in order to perform a lending practice, right? And so a lot of those lending practices got washed away in what's called deregulation, okay? The deregulation is this. The deregulation allowed banks to justify moving the individual risk or even the small business risks substantially down. Okay? When my dad bought his first house in Connecticut back in 1980, the interest rate that he got on his house was 13%, and that was standard. Okay? And that probably blows all of you out of the water because you're used to dealing with interest rates that are between 3 and 4%. Okay? So when interest rates have that kind of disparity, it's all about the risk that's associated with that, right? The reason that was true is because the Fed fund rate at the time, they didn't want a ton of exchange transfers happening, was somewhere around 6%. And that's just the federal government saying, we get that as an exchange rate, which means that in order for them to make a profit, they're also going to have to charge like another 6% in order just to recoup the cost. You're looking at 12% to establish home loans. Same goes for automobiles, and same kind of logic goes for small businesses. Okay? What's important is that only the Fed funds rate can be moderated by the Federal Reserve Board. So when we talk, yes? I'm sorry, you said that, that, that the federal government automatically always is, 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 takes 6% of any type of... No, it's a, tra it's a required interest transfer rate. So what happens, so the Fed fund, the Fed doesn't do anything. The Fed says, in order for Bank A to transfer funds to Bank B, that interest must be at a certain level because it's a lending. Otherwise, banks are like, hey, you want to shake hands and I'll pay you back at $100,000? They'd be like, sure, scratch my back, you scratch yours a year later. And the Fed's like, no, we shouldn't do that. You are required to charge a 6% interest rate if you want to sell to Kimberly. To the Fed, like they have to own up to them? Or who do no, no, it's just a, it's a regulation. Got it. Okay. Right? Just, this is a requirement. You are bank A, you are bank B. If you lend to bank B, you must charge them a 6% rate. Oh, okay. So it's just standard. Right. So this virtually zero rate now is basically a trade money. Just make it free-flowing, right? They want a ton of transactions because it lowers the barrier to moving and taking risk. Because if, you're, if I'm forcing you to take, uh, absorb a 6% transaction requirement, in order for you to now make money, you have to be charging, she has to be charging more than that, right? Because if she wants money at 6%, she needs to be making 6 plus. So she's planning on lending out at 7%. She needs to make some back right. and then pay the Right, and also pay you. Exactly. So the Fed's fund rate moderates that. It's like ensures accountability. Exactly. Okay. And remember, the bank is not providing collateral on that loan. That's why it's so risk. That's why the federal government requires risk because that's what happens when banks fail, right? A bank fails, they don't have collateral. It's not like here's my house, 
right? Like that's that's what they do to individuals, right? They take back your automobile, they take back your home, they you know liquidate small business, small businesses. You can't you know bankruptcy court is like super complicated. And, you know that's a totally different structure, but I think that generally gets across the point. Okay, so. Fed funds rate, very important, just because we have a lot of United States federal government actors. Prime rate is important because it's a very good measure of um, the expectation of individuals. So consistent prime rates uh, you know, for long term are what investors really like, because investors uh, like to see steady prime rates not fluctuating greatly, which means you can't have a fluctuating Fed decisions. right? So it all starts kind of here. The ability to trade money. And then you see the effects here, right? These two numbers are kind of irrelevant to you. It's the standard lending rates for certain types of loans, right? So we talk about securities on loans. You, you typically have, like, let's talk about houses because I just know a lot about that. So you have a 30 year mortgage versus a 15 year mortgage, okay? You have a $100,000 house. Your payback on a 30 year mortgage, okay, is probably going to be around. Uh, 800 bucks a month, okay? Versus a 15-year mortgage, you're probably going to be have to paying around uh, 1,200 a month, okay? So what was happening in the subprime is that this number on the 30-year mortgage was getting significantly depressed, okay? Because we were charging only charging like 4%, or well, we we're still charging 4%, um, but we were lending at like 6%. So people were seeing this number drop and they're like, wow, $600 a month for 30 years, I could own a home? Like that becomes a real decision making calculus. And then people like grab that 30 year mortgage and then the economy collapses, they can no longer pay that back and they collapse, right? Because they didn't, they didn't have the back solvency of you know, having like two to three years worth of paychecks in the bank to be able to continue to pay that when things got tough. And that's why we went through a ton of foreclosures. All right. Um, so those, those standard lending rates are predicated off of type of loans. You have your 30 year loans, your 15 year loans, you have your ARM loans, which your ARM loans are uh, adjustable variable rate interest loans. Those usually last between one to five years. Those are bridge loans for a variety of things. Say you want $10,000 to remodel your kitchen, you can get an ARM loan. ARM loans allow you to basically uh, request a very short term loan that allows this interest rate to fluctuate which is dangerous as hell, all right? If interest rates start going up every month by like 0.25%, you're gonna be paying that loan and might not be able to pay it back by the time that it's due. So, you know, you see those credit cards, they're like, you know, 2% or 0% for the first year and then it's like 26% after that, right? It's kind of one of those things. Yes? So like, by the way you're describing it, arm loans seem like not a very good idea in any way. What, in what instance Okay, so ARM loans are super uh, beneficial for very short-term transactions that you don't have capital for at the moment. For example, let's say you have a student loan, I'm just going to make up a number at 10% for some ungodly reason, okay? And you can pay off that with an ARM loan of, let's say, $10,000, okay? You ex absorb the risk of the ARM loan because the ARM loan will have something like a standard lending rate of like 3.5%. So instead of paying 10% interest now, you're going to pay 3.5% interest or you hope, you pray that it doesn't go past 10%, right? So now you pay off your loan of $100,000 and now you owe someone else at 3.5% as opposed to owing 10% on your but original But you want to be able to pay them back very quickly. Exactly. Because so it still stays at 3.5, right? Right, if you can pay them back very quickly. So, I mean, this is gonna get kind of complicated, but lots of loans have mandatory uh, year requirements on them. So for example, on ARM loans, you might take out a five-year ARM loan at 3.5%, okay? If you do that, they say, that's fine, there will be a penalty against you if you pay us all of that money back prior to year three. That's so messed up. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, and that is a very uh, typical practice. Yes? Are there any like, regulations like, against how much interest can you do with these loans? Uh, 
there used to be. <laughs> um, and that's part of the problem. So what happens when people get in messed up situations is they're like, holy crap, I need $100,000 right now. Or otherwise, I'm not going to be able to pay my medical bills or something like that. Sometimes they'll go to um, these arm loans to be able to uh, facilitate that. And uh, it used to be that the regulations were very specific. They could only like uh, lend out certain portions of equity based on arm loans. So what happens is you have collateral, uh, in this instance, arm loans are usually based on collateral that you secure. So when you do, when you do a house, this is the easiest way to explain it. Okay. You have a house, okay? It's worth $300,000. But let's say you have $150,000, okay, and you give the bank $150,000, okay? This means that you have $150,000 in equity and $150,000 that you owe to someone else. This is called a first lien. Okay. So, you are asking for the bank for $150,000 on a $300,000 asset, okay? So they're probably going to be willing to do that for you, right? Usually the standard practice rates uh, right now, uh, well, it's a federal, this is a federal requirement, is that uh, any home loan that does not put down 20% of the value of the loan is required to take out special insurance. It's called private mortgage insurance which is an additional risk factor based on the standard lending that says not only do you have to pay a 6% rate because you didn't put down 20% of the loan, so if I only put down, let's say, a dollar, right, I'm basically at 100% I'm asking for the bank, right? Because banks will never loan you more than the collateral is worth. It's just a standard rule. They would never give you $300,000 for this house, or $300,001. They can't do that. That is a requirement. Okay, but the private mortgage insurance says, okay, you don't have 20%, that's okay, but you're an additional risk factor now. Now instead of getting a 4% loan, you're required to pay 5% until you start making, until you're back at 20% of the original loan. So, let's make these numbers easy or for me to calculate my head. Um, $80,000. $20,000, okay? So I've put down 20% of the $100,000 collateral. So my asset is at 20%. Now, it's not 20% of the original value, right? This is more than that. So 80, I'm not asking for a $100,000 loan. I'm asking for an $80,000 $80, loan. So let's say I have $20,000, I need $100,000. I've already given the bank $20,000. That's 20% 20 of my collateral on the loan. We're good. Don't need the extra rate. Okay. In arms, in these other instances, when you take out equity loans or second lines or mortgages as credit, you can initiate that with a new bank, or usually it's your original bank. But you say, you're like, oh, crap, man. I need like an extra 50 k to like, you know, pay for these hospital bills. You can take out a second lien that says, not only am I going to pay you the $100,000, I'm going to pay you an additional payment of like $50 a month on the same terms as my original loan for you to loan me that cash right now. Okay? Because loans and interest are all about a fixed amount and then the price that someone is willing to give you for that loan. So, yeah, I'll give you $50,000, but I expect $60,000 by the time I'm done, right? So that is the interest rate that you're being charged. So these arm loans are used when you can quickly pay back a loan, right? So you want to take out an extra, you know, 50 grand to do whatever. You can add a second lien using the equity in, uh, or the equity or the leverage on your house. So this gets super complicated 
and part of the housing bubble because these numbers are predicated off of the value of your home, which greatly increased around 2007. So the average like $100,000 home suddenly became like worth a quarter of a million dollars. Okay, so banks were had way more collateral against the loan. So instead of you having twenty thousand dollars being paid off, have a hundred thousand dollars remaining to be paid off, you had this huge area in which you could take out equity on your home. Okay, <laughs> you had an extra like hundred thousand dollars that just magically disappeared that you could loan, right? Because the bank's going to be like, well, how much is your asset worth? And they're like, well, well my asset's worth, you know, about $250,000. They're going to be like, you want 50 grand? Whatever, sure, right? Here, take a 2% loan. Yes? So when you're borrowing money, right, um, you, you uh, can only borrow the amount you need for your house, right? But if you, unless you get a second lien, which you have its own interest. Correct. Which is why people get arm loans and or refinance. Okay. Refinancing is a lot less complicated and a lot less risky. So you would have basically two separate You have two separate, separate loans. Okay. That's correct. With their own. Okay. So when people talk about first mortgage and second mortgage, it becomes pretty typical that you own a, you're in a home for 30 years, okay? You're paying off this at 800 bucks a month, okay? You're like, holy crap. My floors are going to shit, I need a new roof, my water heater is going, I need a new furnace, right? I like, I can't live in this house. What am I going to do? Hopefully, you all aren't dumb enough to do that and have savings, but a lot of people aren't that smart, and what happens is they need to take out a loan in order to secure the quality of their home. Because what would happen, they've just spent 15 years building equity into a home that is what, now worthless? So they do is they take out a second mortgage and say, I need you to lend me some money so that I can make home improvements, okay? Or, and this is my favorite, when we talk about midlife crises, people are like, 15 years, man, I could really use another sweet motorcycle, right? They take out a second mortgage on their house to provide collateral for this big, expensive purchase, like a motorhome or an RV, right? And they use the house as a security for that, so they get a second mortgage. So you have the first mortgage on the house, and then you have a second mortgage that is for an additional amount that you purchased, all of which the collateral is the house. What is the time frame on the second mortgage? Because you just absolutely variable usually. So usually second mortgages, because of standard practice is thirty year mortgage. Okay. Uh, usually secondary mortgages uh, come year fifteen ish. Okay, and usually you get a 15 year extension. Now, back to your question about why or why I would ever get an, uh, an arm loan or what are the regulations on that. These are where the regulations come in because a lot of people don't want to do a second mortgage. What they want to do is they want to say, no, I just want this money short term, I'll pay you back really quick. Okay, and I'll take the risk of doing an arm loan on a variable interest rate and just hope it doesn't go over my, my house interest. Because I don't want to owe someone for an additional 15 years. I want to owe someone for like five years. Did you ever owe an interest rate that's less than what you originally took out? Like, like totally struck you Yes. Your risk? So that is called, that is more along the lines of refinancing. So, for example, let's say that you took out, uh, uh, this house is messed up. Um, <laughs> You took out a hundred thousand. You uh, you're paying. This is the loan amount, hundred thousand dollars. You need, uh, and you're paying ten percent of that. So let's say you're paying a thousand dollars a month. Fifteen years down the road, you're like, holy crap! Interest rates are at three percent. What? Yes, I want you to refinance my original debt at three percent. Okay. So what happens is they say, okay, well, you've been paying us $100,000 for 10 years. The actual loan amounts that you require are somewhere around, like, let's, let's say you were really good, and you're down around $70,000, okay? So you restructure this debt at 3%. So you, basically what you do is you say, I, paid off, I pay this off, okay? Bank, pay off $70,000. I will start a new loan with you for $70,000 at 3%. 
Oh, so you have to start over if it goes down. You can. So remember, mortgages are different. So you have 30-year mortgages, right? And you also have 15-year mortgages. And those are called conventional fixed mortgages. So conventional <laughs> fixed mortgages at 30 years versus conventional fixed at 15 carry different interest rates. Actually, the 15-year carries a lower interest rate a lot of times because you're – because – well, it's not because you're paying more. It's because you're, the collateral and the risk on the loan is less, okay? Because you're only – the bank is taking a bet on you for 15 years as opposed to taking the original bet, which was 30 years on you. And lots of times, people during that 15 years are making more money, and so they're willing to pay more. So instead, of, so lots of times when people refinance, they're like, well, I understand that I could take out $70,000 and just restructure that way, but what I want to do is I want to give you an additional payment of like uh, $10,000. Now I only want to owe $60,000 at 3%, and then you, know, you get to slam it down even more. Hopefully everyone's understanding the power of compounding interest, <laughs> right? This is all what banks do, is they play numerous games on interest rates and your risk to be able to make judgment calls. And when things get inflated and not regulated, like we talked about, when your home value escalates exponentially and you can take out more and more money because they perceive your risk to be less because the collateral on the loan is fine, then you're in a variety of pain when things go bad. And that is what causes bubbles. And when they pop, things go poorly. Okay? All right. So we talked a lot about houses. Let's talk a little bit about unemployment and the way that um, just okay. Real quick, what does ARM stand for again? Uh, adjustable rate mortgage. I would look that up, but I think that's correct. Okay, unemployment. All right, I think it's pretty clear that unemployment is fairly high in the United States compared to what we're used to. Okay. Um, there is a thing called the natural rate of unemployment. The natural rate of unemployment is the idea that at around 2%, there's enough exchange occurring where people looking for jobs and people entering and or retiring, and the lag time between filling all of those positions and people rotating is a natural process in the economy. Okay? That rate is at 2%. Okay? It's, just, it's a theoretical construct. People and economists kind of agree it's around there. Okay? Anything above that okay, is considered you know, the unemployment level, okay, if you will. So I think we're at around like 6.5%. I didn't look it up where I was, but it's been pretty, it's been going down because it was originally somewhere around 9.6% in some states. I mean, it's pretty bad. You think about that as a percentage, that means about one in 10 people weren't employed. When you think, yes? So is that the 2% uh, like considered in all the figures that we hear about the unemployment rate? Like the unemployment rate contains all unemployment. So when we talk about, 3% uh, employment, that's like unemployment, that's like amazing, right? Because at a perfect system, 2% is what we expect, right? And 3% is just like, holy crap, everyone has a job, right? When we start getting past that, it's like, whoa, you know, people, Joe next door just lost his job kind of stuff, okay? So you think like 9.7%, that means one in every 10 Americans not having a job. You know that average number of people that own homes significantly higher than one in ten. Okay, and that's why we have massive bubbles and massive foreclosures. It's because these people didn't have enough money to pay off, continuing paying off that monthly payment. Okay, so natural rate is about two percent. Okay, there's a variety of unemployment aspects that go very underutilized when we talk about just unemployment figures. <clears throat> so, what we want to do is we want to break down new unemployment and old unemployment. Okay? If there's a lot of new people entering the unemployment circuit, okay, that is a very bad sign. Right? Because it means that things are picking up in a way that we weren't expecting. OK? 
okay? If we have long-term lagging unemployment, it means that new jobs are not being created. So this is a new, no new jobs, new jobs don't happen. And this means that jobs are being cut. These might be different month by month. One might go up, one might go down. The reason for that is that new jobs often are in very specific sectors, okay? And you can't build, when we talk about a holistic number of unemployment, you can't just be like, you can work there, right? Because we all have different degrees, we all have different specialties. So it takes a while to like fill certain booming sectors, if you will, right? So when we talk about things like, um, uh, uh, the financial sector uh, jobs increasing. It's usually taken as a good sign for the overall health because in order for financial sector to be doing well, all sectors must be doing well, as opposed to construction. Okay, Good sign that buildings are increasing, but if we just isolate it to construction, it might mean different things. So you have to look at the new and, un uh, new and old employment figures in order to figure out where we are on like kind of the scale of either ramping up or having stagnation in which new jobs aren't being created. Okay. Uh, other things that are important about unemployment is um, the, uh, so we talk about number of new applicants, number, and probably a very offensive term, discouraged workers. So unemployment does run out, right? So there are people, and when we talk about extending unemployment benefits, which is absolutely needed, in my opinion, uh, there is, um, unemployment usually lasts for, I believe, six months in the state of Washington. It requires certain insurance um, uh, to be met. But it's basically the state pays you um, a, a, a fraction of your salary to make sure that you can cover a variety of costs till you find a new job, okay? There are people where this process has gone on so long they are past the six months, but we've done extensions. We've done six months, 12 months, year and a half, in some instances. We're getting to the point now where there are workers who are discouraged that are looking for work and are unemployed, okay? That is a terrifying situation to be If your discouraged worker numbers stop dropping, that is a sign of a very health of coming out of recession. Okay? It's really important to look at that number as well as the number of new applicants. Because if you're having discouraged workers enter the marketplace, it means that they're, that they're probably fairly skilled. right? They've probably had some number of years of experience in their field and it was hard for them to find a job. Now, they're being hired again, which would indicate their section of their economy is doing, uh, or that section of the economy is doing well. If new applications start increasing in certain sectors, that's an uh, indication of direct health of that sector currently, right? So again, these can be in opposite directions. This is how we cut U.S. economy up, U.S. economy down files, right? Because these numbers might be conflicting, okay? When we talk about unemployment dropping, right? that is always going to be a U.S. economy up. But if discouraged workers are increasing that aren't reflected in unemployment numbers, because they're no longer unemployed, they're just they're not part of the employment circle, right? So when we talk about unemployment, it's the people that are receiving unemployment benefits. People that don't get unemployment benefits aren't calculated in those numbers. It's very important <laughs> to remember that, okay? So when we talk about the real rate of unemployment, it includes people that are not in the classic unemployment numbers. The classic unemployment is just the number of people receiving unemployment checks. It is a raw number. Okay? If you do not receive a check, you are not part of that percentage. Okay. Other things that commonly talked about is the stock market. Okay. Stocks. 
two main categories. You have growth stocks, and you have um, kind of stagnant ETF stocks. Okay. You guys are classically familiar with growth stocks. You see the S&P is at, you know, 1,900 or, you know, across $100,000 on the NASDAQ. What? Okay. Wait, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with that. So yeah. What did you say? Okay, so the S&P and the NASDAQ, two classical stock, uh, stock markets in the United States, right? S&P 500 is standard course 500. It's the, uh, basically in order to make that be on the S&P 500, you have to be one of the top 500 uh, companies. You know, they don't trade small business Accounts. Those are on pink. Those are where we. Those are traded on what are called pink sheets. If you're interested in pink, pink sheets and are uh, over the age of 18, I recommend watching the Wolf of Wall Street. They do a whole expose on penny stocks and you know a variety of other things. Anyway, um, so uh, growth stocks. So I don't know. Let's pick. Uh, hell, Caterpillar. They make construction equipment. They are considered a growth stock. They um, seek to expand their business. They seek to um, find new customers. They need to hire new people, right? And the value of that company is reflected in a per share basis, okay? And the number of shares that a company has, i.e. the volume of shares, uh, determines the company's worth, right? So uh, when they traded, uh, I don't know, 100 uh, a billion shares at $1 a piece, they are a billion dollar company. Keep the number simple. Okay, so when they aren't capable of selling stuff, when they have to lay off workers, when their efficiency isn't great, and let's say their stock drops to uh, 50 cents. They are now half a million dollar company, right? Stock dropped by half would be a lot, right? But what your expectation is, is that year over year, when you invest in a company, because your stock purchase is an investment that says, I am basically providing you with a dollar that the expectation is, is in the long term when I, I can sell that later for more than it's worth at a dollar. Okay? Typically, stocks generally grow at around 3 to 4% a year, much higher than the savings rate currently. Okay? And the expectation is year after year that is the case. Okay? So it's a way, it's a, just a different way to invest probably not as familiar with is ETF stocks, and I can't remember the exact acronym, but these stocks pay you directly back. They do not put their money in a direct, uh, uh, back directly into the company. Some of them do, but usually a portion is paid directly back to you. So these are often in dividend stocks or uh, master limited partnerships. Master limited partnerships are very specific to the oil and gas company. You read about Kerr Morgan in the news recently. Pretty good articles about that. I encourage you. Anyway, dividend stocks say uh, you got a dollar, all right, and it costs a dollar to, to buy me. And every quarter of the year, I'm going to give you a penny, okay? And I'm not going to put it back in the value of the stock. I'm literally going to give you a penny, right? And it's going to go into a bank account. And that is how you make your money. You don't get it based on the stock price, you get it based on the money that they directly give you. So your expectation is you're not going to be selling that in the long term, right? So when you look at growth stocks, they are a very good reflection of how companies are trying to move um, their valuation. ETF stocks are a great way to look at how people are trying to either acquire money or how um, much they're paying out in dividends. Let's say I didn't make that much this year, and I can't pay you a penny. I can pay you half of a penny, right? So they modulate their income on what they think they can pay you, right? So instead of making 1%, now you're making half a percent. Guess what? And half a percent is probably not worth my time. Sell it off, put all my money in a savings account, make more money there, right? And so that's called investor flight. Investor flight happens when growth stocks or ETF stocks stop paying the expectation, okay? That's why we have analyst reviews that say, by the end of the year, our expectation is that a stock is $130, okay? And whenever analysts raise expectations, people flood to buy that stock because their expectation is now that it's going to be worth more. 
in the future. So, for example, the company uh, this has happened to recently is, uh, I believe, uh, 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 U.S. Bank. Okay, their recent projections were at like fifteen dollars and sixty cents a share, and they came out last quarter like, "Yo, we've been doing sweet. We got some." expectations that we're going to be at $18 a share by the end of the year, which is a massive increase, right? Between 15%, uh, sorry, $15 and $18. It's like, whoa, $3 on a $15 investment? That's crazy a lot. So people immediately flood in to buy that stock, right? Because it's now, it's the expectation is it'll be worth more. And that's why stocks are evaluated every day, and they're traded on the floor in instantaneous time, because you have to have that understanding. It's a good reflection of the volatility as well in the in the economy, if stocks are trading at large volumes, is something to be very aware of. Okay, stocks that trade at large volumes typically indicate that people are willing to invest and take more risk. It's a sign of a very healthy economy when the when the stock exchange is moving volume. Okay, any time in which there's moving volume, economies tend to do better. Okay, you don't want to stagnate, right? You don't want to buy something and then just hold on to it forever. That's why stocks are constantly invested, reinvested, reevaluated, and it's an entire sector of the economy is finance. Okay? A lot of it has to do with the way in which evaluations are occurring. Okay? Another thing we should probably talk about are treasury bills or bonds and savings. Okay. Treasury bills, T bills, slash uh, long term, um, long term IOUs. Okay, T bills are basically IOUs in the United States federal government that says I will give you a um, hundred dollars on this date <coughs> if you give me X amount of money now. Okay, this is how T bill auctioning works. They say. We're gonna, we need a billion dollars. I'm going to write IOUs for a billion dollars spread by $1,000 units. How much will you give me right now so that I can sell you this IOU for $1,000? They say, I'll give you $900 right now. All right? And someone says, all right, yeah, I'll give you $900 right now. Someone says, I'll give you $800. And they're like, all right, the next guy says $850. The other, and you know, they're basically auctioning them off, each one at a time, right? But it's more units, it's a lot more complicated. Anyway, that's how an auction works. Um, uh, so the difference, but no one, the, the point is, is that no one pays $1,000. You said that someone will sell an IOU saying, I'll, I promise you. United States Federal Government. Okay, they'll, be like, they'll, say, they'll sell you an IOU promising, I'll pay you back $100 or $1,000. Uh, so these T bills are worth about, uh, are, I believe they're all done in thousand dollars. Okay, well I thought you said a hundred at no, first. Sorry, like, no my bad. Sell. Yeah, okay. I was doing, I was doing interest rates. Okay. Um, okay, but the point is, no one pays a thousand dollars. Why would I give you a loan, I, loaning you money for free, right? So the difference between, you know, thousand dollars and someone buying it for eight hundred gets amortized, which means that the amount of interest you are actually accruing uh, is like somewhere around, in this instance, would be like, I believe, 2.5%. Okay. So basically what happens is the federal government is giving you 2.5% of, of a growth in your fund, guaranteed, right? Because your risk is at 800, and you are betting the United States federal government doesn't go into default. Right? The United States federal government, everyone's default, trust me, we would not be at debate camp. Um, we would be in a lot worse shape. Um, anyway, it's basically like a, a free guarantee that you're going to get $1,000 on X date. And the difference between $1,000 and $80 based on the year, which is usually 5 to 15 years, depending on the T-bill, um, is the interest rate that you get on your loan. Because at 2% over 15 years turns into $1,000, right? So... This 8%, when you grow it at 2.5%, if I had a savings account, it'd become $1,000. This is basically the reverse. It is, you give someone $800 and they guarantee you $1,000 at, at the next, at the date that's spot. But this rate, this money that you pay for is called the, this differential rate 
It's called a par rate. It's rated, right? So let's say one month I'm able to sell them all at 800. The next month I'm able to sell them at 700, okay? My par rate went up because I'm now getting 3.5% on my evaluation because I only had to give you 700 now. So my investment gets better. If I only pay you uh, $500, I get a 50% par rate, right? That never happens, right? T-bills are normally bought in like fractions of a minutia of uh, this um, $1,000. They're I think they're normally purchased of like $99 and like, yeah, somewhere around there, right? They're like, because a 2.5% growth over five years will be about 1000 So really, it's like your only risk is like eight bucks, right? And people don't think the United States federal government is going to do that. But this is how the federal government kind of modulates money supply as well, because they can just auction off money. Is anyone familiar with the term of the auctioning off money that we've been doing for a while now? Anybody heard of quantitative easing? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is quantitative easing. This is artificially adding more money to the pool of money. I need, you know, a billion dollars. I'm going to just auction it off, right? This is how we have become fairly in debt. <laughs> just a little bit. Okay. What a lot of people don't realize, though, is that there are bond funds, okay? They operate in a very similar way. Okay. And they occur at state municipal levels as well as business loans. Okay? And the risk on each of these uh, is very different than the federal government. Okay? So let's say you're a startup and you need a business loan. Um, well, not, startups aren't a great idea. Uh, just a, let's just let's say a, an S&P country wants to go into Turkey. Okay? They need to raise capital. They need to find investors. Right? To do that, what they do is they issue long-term IOUs or loan bonds, right? And they basically say, I need a million dollars. I will give you 3% interest. Do I have any takers? No? OK. 4% interest. Any takers? No. 5%. I've got a hit. OK, so I need to give somewhere around 5 to 5.5% interest on that. And these loans are modulated basically by credit agencies. So if you have a AAA credit rating, which the United States federal government does, and all government agencies have some kind of rating, but every business has their own rating too. This is where you get into the B ratings, the C ratings. Those ratings kind of dictate to the market how much you need to charge for interest in order for people to be willing to loan you money. Because remember, interest on a loan is the risk you assume. Okay. If you are, have to loan out at 50%, it means you are a huge risk. It means you might fail by the time that I get my money back. Right? And there are business loans at 50%. Okay? How many of those people get paid? Not many. <laughs> right? It's called junk bonds. Right? And lots of shady investors do lots of weird things with junk bonds. Like they artificially buy an entire section of uh, a junk bond market, like say in uh, nails. Okay, to artificially screw the screw market, right? Because now nails are cheaper, and then they'll short sell those, and then make a ton of money by by people not realizing that was what they were doing. Because interest rates are so variable in these business loans and these uh, bonds, uh, people do very sketchy things. All right, um, and state governments, you can't remember, can't deficit spend, right? T bills are a deficit that's spent by the federal government. They are a, an IOU, basically, that's just like this. But states can do bonds, right? And they do bonds and levies, and they say, all right, I need a million dollars to build this new school. We're going to have a bond or a levy, okay? And people say, all right, fine. You know, I sign my ballot. I do this. Basically, what you're doing is you're saying, uh, I am willing to allow this, uh, the state to acquire that million dollars Okay, at an acceptable interest rate, out of whatever their credit rating is. Okay, because it's not like states can just magically make money, right? Only federal government can do that. So that's how they raise money. Is they're called state and municipal bonds, right? And they're very generally very safe. What's the probability that a state is gonna 
that the United States federal government is going to let a state default on a bond. It's pretty low. However, this has happened. Where has it happened in the United States? Does anyone remember? Detroit. Did it happen in Detroit? Well, my favorite place for debating? Stockton. <laughs> right? First bankrupt country in a uh, bankrupt uh, bond. And all their bonds became junk. Right? They couldn't pay off their bonds. And the investors didn't get paid. Right? That's what happens. You assumed the risk. You assumed the risk of 4%. You said that was an acceptable risk I was willing to take. So back to this whole regulation question, and it's very important, right? There used to be a ton of restrictions and requirements and verification processes and strict scrutiny of the way in which you were de designing your bonds, the way in which your company was uh, going to pay your payback structures, what was going to happen if you did go into default. Because sometimes in bankruptcy court, you can have certain like requirements, and a judge says, all right, these people need to be paid first with your liquid assets, right? Then this set of investors gets paid. That's a fairly typical structuring in a bankruptcy. But to deregulation, they took a lot of those requirements out and just let businesses go wild. They're like, I can get money with basically zero risk now, right? Because I don't have to jump through all these hoops, I don't have to do all these verification processes, and I'm willing to take the risk. I'm a CEO. You can't do anything to me. What happens when I fail? Nothing, right? I'm more than happy to assume a 50% risk. Who am I liable to, right? The answer is, in the old framework, that CEO probably would have been thrown in jail, right? For making poor business decisions because it directly affected stockholders. Now it's just a whatever kind of thing. You see that we caught like caught like several hot trends, like you know the Ponzi schemes and stuff like that. That shit has always been illegal, okay? Like, the stuff that was happening back in 2007 through 2013 was a ton of manipulation of these growth stocks and these ETFs paying out way more than they should have, investing in very shady practices to try and get greater return on their investments, diving down into specific credit ratings, like instead of, like you would see uh, um, retirement funds having Class C bonds. Like, Class C bonds, your probability of default is like around 10%. It's like, what are you doing for these people in retirement, right? They're like, yeah, but I'm making like 12%. It's like, yeah, but if you don't pull out in the next month, you're going to lose all your money, which is exactly what happened, right? <laughs> no, I mean, retirement is, uh, I mean, we, I give a whole section on retirement, but like, uh, it did an enormous amount of damage to people that are no longer working. Okay, because a lot of people that are no longer working actually get a fair amount of money from what are uh, paid off in quarterly uh, dividends, either in savings or stocks, right? So every quarter you get a check, right, in your savings account. It's usually it's an automatic depart deposit now, but you know it's like ten bucks, you know, as your interest uh, for the month. Well, people in retirement expect that kind of savings and that money and these dividends, you know, paid each month. Okay, the answer is they weren't being paid as much because interest rates plummeted, the value of their stocks went down, they, their assets they were expecting to have went rapidly down. I mean, I can tell you, like, just from my parents' experience, that the stuff that happened in 07 and 08 easily delayed their ability to retire by five years, right? And they're close to retirement age now, right? That's a massive flow to the economy, right? And any economic event that costs and it causes real world things too. Don't get me wrong. When I say stuff is messed up, it is not because individuals were making poor decisions. It is because the federal government did really shady things and really shady people did things they shouldn't have. Like loan to people they knew couldn't pay it back because their house was worth so much. If they went into foreclosure, the bank would have made money. That is messed up. That is not the fault of any one of you or your parents. That is the fault of the federal government for allowing that to happen. We can have that discussion later, but don't, I don't want anyone to think otherwise that I'm like dogging on bad financial decisions, right? It is a structural problem.
Are you an econ major? Nope. <laughs> I took one econ class. <laughs>